and you get really nervous and stuff. So uh, hopefully you can can uh, can fight through it. It's gonna be all right. I'll try. All right, cool. Uh, well, let's start with let's start with my sound uh, my quick sound check. So what you what did you have for breakfast this morning? Um, I was actually just eating it before I got on, but I am partial to toast with peanut butter and bananas. Hey, that's a good one. Do you ever do the avocado <laughs> toast? That's very popular here right now. Uh, avocados. Oh man, avocados. Yeah, Don't get me good. started. Yeah, no, avocados are good. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, I think we are sounding good. So why don't we jump into it? So why don't okay. you tell my listeners uh, what you're currently raising money for over on Kickstarter? Yes. So we have a sleeping bag and travel bed that is made out of ripstop nylon with a high quality synthetic fill. And it was inspired by my dog, River, who I took backpacking with me and he got really, really cold on an overnight trip near Mount Hood. So I decided to make him a sleeping bag and we've had a lot of support and it's been amazing so far. So that's cool. I've never really, this is the first time I've seen a, uh, a dog sleeping bag. So what makes yeah. a, uh, a dog sleeping bed after, uh, instead of, you know, I don't know, the, the random blanket that's in the back of the car, what makes this one? Special? Right. <laughs> well, um, for me, it was something I wanted to put on my back. So, okay. you know, the blanket in the back of the car is great, but it can be a little heavy. Um, if it gets wet, it's super heavy and, you know, it's not very insulating. So um, I actually looked around and there were a couple options on the market uh, when I was looking, but they were polyester or they didn't have a fill that I liked. My dog's not spoiled at all, by the way, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> being like a total gear junkie, um, you know, I wanted to make him the best possible equipment for a backpacking trip. So that's how I ended up with the doggy bag. That's cool. What kind of dog is it? He's a mutt. We think okay. he's mostly a Manchester Terrier, but uh, I got him. Uh, he was a rescue pup from nice. Virginia. So Very nice, we don't right? know. Could okay. be anything. Okay. <laughs> so, so, you know, what's kind of the... Um, sort of the the sketch of this i mean obviously you're out and you're doing the trip and you start thinking like hey this could be a possible product but what starts the process when you start kind of diving into you know making a, a sleeping bag product like this um you know for me i guess it was the materials first um you probably actually hear that a lot is mm -hmm. maybe there's something out there but it's just you can't understand why it doesn't seem to work or why it seems so expensive for a product that doesn't seem to be made that with that expensive of materials. Um, and I think as you delve into it, you start to find out some of those answers uh, sure. sometimes. But, <laughs> um, but, you know, for me, it was really, I felt like the dog market, there were a lot of things being pushed onto consumers of pet products that were pretty low quality with really high margins for the companies. There wasn't a lot of interaction with customers. Um, and I didn't really feel comfortable putting my money into that. They're mm -hmm. expensive products. And I just felt like there had to be something better. So, um, so I decided the doggy bag was mostly made for River, but it's kind of our first product for Wild River as well. Wow. That's cool. And is this something that you had, like, uh, do you do this? I mean, it, it seems like that's a big, big jump again, getting into producing a product. What's kind of your background? I mean, how, 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 where did you start? Well, so I was actually going to grad school at the time for sports product management. Hmm. Um, okay. And we had been kind of going through the process of creating a product. It's uh, put on by the University of Oregon. Um, in Portland, Oregon. And so I'd been with a group and gone through the process of creating a product and kind of bringing it to life, which was a process I really enjoyed. Sure. It's my yeah. favorite part. <laughs> <laughs> the businessy stuff I can live without, but the product's fun. So um, so I decided to take that education and, and try to go from A to Z all over again. So been quite the adventure <laughs> that's cool and and was this something that what you said it was tied into the university or was it like a, a program outside of it how was it tied into into Oregon so I was a grad student there when I came up with the idea and mm -hmm. then um it was through a lot of my experience there um I had a great lab instructor uh her name was Krista and she kind of helped me to figure out okay what are the materials you need? How do you source everything? Mm -hmm. And oh, you got a cutie in your background there. Uh, um, <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, my dog will be probably be barking yeah. at some point. It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, but she, you know, really kind of walked me through the process and how to approach suppliers. Um, I was also able to go to a conference called Outdoor Retailer in Colorado, thanks to my graduate program, which is where I connected with my manufacturer. So it really helped me to get started. Um, I'm not yes. sure yes. how I would have done it without that. Yeah, that sounds like amazing support. Uh, you know, yeah. in, in your area in general, what is like the entrepreneur spirit? Are there a lot of incubators or mentors or groups to go to? What, what's it like there? So Portland has become a, kind of a startup hub for um, sports and outdoors. Of course, we have Nike here. Mm -hmm. So um, there's a lot of encouragement for small businesses in this area. Um, I especially find a lot of encouragement with uh, female entrepreneurs um, and, and women in business. Uh, the outdoor world, it, it can be tough. It's, um, it's all very small, um, but it's also, it's also very welcoming. People are always kind of willing to share with you their stories. Um, I don't know if you know Rumpel, the blanket company. Yeah, yep, yep, they moved here recently and Wiley at Rumpel has been hugely helpful and just so I think it's a great community like if you reach out people are really willing to talk about their experience and share so that's been hugely helpful that's cool what's been mm -hmm. um has there been a major roadblock at all that you ran into in this uh, in designing this stuff what, what's been the the big headache well I mean I think a, a big reason that people end up on Kickstarter is a to prove product market fit but B um, for financing production um, mm -hmm. minimum order quantities are tough um, I was really lucky to have a manufacturer um, called Ivy fashion that was really willing to work with me on that and mm -hmm. they allowed me to have a really low quantity but it's still ten thousand dollars is not a lot um for a production run it's actually pretty low yeah. but here i am just getting out of grad school with a bunch of debt and i you know i'm working at this full time so it's still a lot of money to me <laughs> right, right 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 um so luckily you know through kickstarter i've been able to fund my production and and the products are on their way so that's cool and, and how about the uh, sort of the, the flip side of that was there a moment where maybe you got a prototype or you just knew that you had like something to to kind of keep going down the rabbit hole with that you should keep going with was there a moment that that kind of sunk in you know it's um it's always tough because there's always setbacks i worked with another manufacturer before and um they didn't really they were really helpful and and really trying to help but they didn't quite see the same vision and I think that that was frustrating and then when I found my new manufacturing partner they were so on top of things they got you know exactly what I was like I have box mesh box baffles mm -hmm. in the quilt of our doggy bag which like no, nobody I mean yeah. nobody does that for a right. dog um and they were just totally like excited about it and on board and designing right next to me and I think that kept me going. Um, a lot of our partnerships with nonprofits kept me going because there's there's always those days where you're like, goodness, what am I doing? Sure, sure. Well, walk me through some of those. What what kind of partnerships with nonprofits and stuff? Is it like humane society type mm -hmm. of stuff? Or what, what? And what are you doing for them? Or what are you guys doing for each other? Maybe better question. No, it's totally been a partnership. So um, with our doggy bags for every 10 that we sell, we donate one to a local nonprofit called Portland Animal Welfare Team. Oh, awesome. And, yeah, and what they do is they provide uh, veterinary care, food and supplies to people's pets and the people are living in poverty or experiencing um, home insecurity. So um, we just wanted a warm place for these pups to sleep. Of course, it'll be that or monetary equivalent, mm -hmm. whichever will help them more. So, sure. um, and then some of our other partners, we do partner with Oregon Humane Society. Um, we're hoping to do an event with Dove Lewis, which is a veterinary organization out here. Um, and then Puplandia Dog Rescue is uh, another female entrepreneur, except mm -hmm. in the nonprofit sector. And, and she's just been amazing, like so encouraging. If I'm having a rough day, she's like, yeah, I was up till 2 a.m. at the vet with this dog that needed help. And yeah. now I'm off doing like these adoption things. So um, if I ever need to like 
feel like I'm not doing enough, I call her up and <laughs> she's right. always hey, she are, works 24 seven. Yeah. Those oh. are great to have around you. I mean, that all of the support, it sounds like that you have around you is amazing uh, on this project. So, you know, working That's with nonprofits, I, I'm always intrigued with on, um, have they been helping at all with getting your message out and Brandon, were they supportive in like, Hey, I'll put you in a newsletter and stuff like that. Or was there any sort of hesitation yeah. just because they're nonprofit and you're raising money? What, what, what was that sort of dynamic like? Actually, no. And, um, you know, when I was reaching out to them, I was wondering about that too. And I was nervous to ask them, like, can I use your logo and, mm -hmm. and things like that? Because, you know, the other side of partnering with nonprofits is you want it to be mutually beneficial. You don't want to just say, oh, we benefit so-and-so. And then they don't really see any benefit right. from it. Like, that's not cool. So, um, you know, it's actually been, it's been huge for me, especially as an entrepreneur, who I'm pretty scrappy. So uh, we just had an event with Oregon Humane Society. And I was asking them like, well, how much is the booth be? Let me see, like, can I move the numbers around, you know, to make it work? And they're like, oh, we'll take donations instead. So um, they took gift certificates for uh, three doggy bags. Hmm. And I was able to show up at the event and support them, but also support my business. So yeah it's definitely been a two way street. They're right. amazing. That's yeah. Great. So, um, how many people are working on your team? Is it just yourself or did you put a team together for this? Um, it's just me and my pup river who's at my feet right now. <laughs> did you have any thoughts about trying to bring on, a, you know, other team members at all, or, or what's kind of your mindset around kind of how you build, build out, you know, some of the, the strengths, uh, inside of your company and stuff. You know, um, I have thought about that a lot. It's a little difficult right now because I can't offer much in terms of salary. Mm -hmm. And um, I do have people that definitely share my vision and are a huge help to me. And And I'll be kind of like pulling them in bit by <laughs> bit, I'm <Right>. sure. Uh, <laughs> but I think, you know, a lot of people, there's not a lot of security or a feeling of security with a startup. Sure. So, yeah. you know, I never, I never wanted to like, for anyone to feel pressured either, you know, um, to, to work with me and, uh, it's a passion project. Sure. So, um, <laughs> well, that's where they know, have to start. Then they flip into, a, then they flip into real businesses and that's everything. Right. Yeah. But not everyone. I mean, sometimes when it's your dream or your vision, um, you know, people need to see that it's an actual thing before yeah. jumping in with both feet, which I can understand. I'm hoping now after the Kickstarter, oh, yeah. um, you know, hopefully well, I'll get some people on this I mean, team. That, that, that's, you know, it's, it's funny you mentioned that, that that's one of the biggest benefits that I try to tell all my clients and stuff too, where I'm, I, I say to them, you know, yes, the money is an important thing, but also what comes out of this is you have uh, orders, you have people who have, are also on your, they see your vision. You have, you know, these backers become your street team down the road. They're the ones talking about you at a barbecue and, you know, they pull out your product and they're like, oh, that's cool. I want that. All those start, things start to happen that, you know, that you can't put a monetary value on. And it's super, super important. So yeah, that's it, it's why successful Kickstarters are an amazing bump for a lot of businesses. Well, and Kickstarter is an amazing platform. I mean, I actually did try to do pre-sales on my own mm -hmm. um, through our website. And it, I mean, the support and the community with Kickstarter is, it's one of a kind, really. Yeah. It kind of, it really shocked me actually. Yeah. It's, it's a, you know, there's a lot of weird people like myself who I'm holding, like, this is a thinking egg. I bought this off Kickstarter. It showed up today. Uh, I'm now, you know, holding, what is it? it's called the thinking egg. I don't know if you can see it there or not. You see it? Uh, see, it's a little egg. Oh, that's cool. It's made out of like a, a marble. And then I also have one that's made out of gold. Go check them out. Google the thing. Wow. Egg. They raised All right. like, go uh, check them out. Yeah, they raised like half a million dollars for these little things and uh, something like that. Uh, <laughs> So yeah, one wow. of my interviews, so they sent me one of these things and, and uh, I just got it today, but I'm like, yeah, see, this is, this is intriguing. I don't really know exactly what to do with it, but I've got it. It's in my hand and I'm holding it while I talk to you. So um, there you go. But yeah. So well, let's get back. So, you know, when we running a Kickstarter, obviously a lot of stuff going on communications, you know, you and I, we had communications, you have guys like me bothering you and, and all this stuff. How do you stay organized through all this and, and, and stay focused on, on tasks and to do's and, and just keeping your eye focused uh, right now. How, how are you doing it right now? Um, I'm not. I mean, <laughs> I mean, you know, I think um, 
a lot of it is trying to filter and, and focus, but it's, um, it's been a little overwhelming. Definitely, you know, those 16 to 20 hour days that you're just sucked into your laptop and mm -hmm. can't escape. And, you know, um, I mean, I, I heard some of your other uh, Kickstarters had these great ways of organizing and <laughs> I've been meaning to do post-its for a month and it still hasn't happened. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but if it's on my calendar, it should happen. And if I have an alarm set, that helps. Uh, but otherwise it's fly by the seat of my pants most of the time. <laughs> That's funny. Well, uh, like where'd you grow up and stuff? Um, I was born and raised in Oregon, Portland, and Eugene. Okay. Um, and then I spent some time abroad uh, in China and Europe and uh, lived in Virginia for a little bit. And now I'm back on the West what Coast. Were you, what, what were you doing overseas and stuff? Just hanging out? Just going to school? What were you doing? Uh, I taught English for oh, a little while nice. and, and traveled doing that. So it was, cool. it was cool. It, you know, a lot of people ask about Made in USA. Um, which I think is great to do. It's difficult sometimes because um, manufacturers abroad, it's they've been doing it for years and it tends to be passed down generation to generation. And we've kind of lost some of that skill in mm -hmm. the United States. And I think being abroad just, you know, it just made me realize that it's not only about your own community and your own backyard, but some of these companies are also helping in other communities. So mm -hmm. Um, you know, I think it just, it, it opened my eyes a little bit. I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, uh, I, I actually say a lot of times, uh, um, when we, when we do, we do our own product launches, just for my clients, they start realizing how big the world is just like, no, we're, yeah. we're talking to people in Japan. What, I don't know why you're, why are you freaked out about this? They want to buy your thing. They're sending you money. <laughs> why not? Ship it there. Yeah. That's your, that's your goal to figure out. Everything's a, we are a global society. So ship your stuff there. So, um, if only uh, shipping were that easy to, if only, just... oh, I know shipping. <laughs> you know, I've been a part of a project where, sh where shipping killed it. So, um, but yeah, it, it's happened. Um, it's a thing. yeah, it's totally crazy. Uh, how shipping is. There's a, I don't know if you're a podcast listener, but there is a, uh, an amazing reply all, uh, episode where they break down why shipping is what it is and why it can basically it can cost you six bucks to ship from China. But if you wanted to ship from Portland to my house for your product, it'd be like 14 bucks. And it's like, what, what, why is it cheaper from China? <laughs> you know? um, but they break down that whole thing. It's, it's really actually pretty fascinating. Oh, that's interesting. I'll have to listen to that. That's cool. Yeah. And they actually, I think they talked to a Kickstarter campaign. That's where they, they break into it. Cause this guy got so pissed cause he couldn't sell his, uh, his mugs and he was getting competitors and whatever. Yeah. Yep. So no, shipping is, is crazy. If you, if anyone figures out shipping, they should uh, let me know. Cause <laughs> yeah. Yeah. it's a, oof. well, well back to, back to kind of your story. Like, um, like what did yeah. your parents do and stuff when you were growing up? Where's the entrepreneur so, spirit in there? Where, where's that entrepreneur drive? <laughs> well, you know, um, my dad always encouraged me to travel and, uh, but he was a health administrator. He okay. worked a good job, give us a good um, life and all that stuff. And my mom was able to stay home with us, uh, for a little while when I was growing up and she does ultrasound. Mm. So they're both in the health field, which grossed me out. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I honestly, I, I used to paint and I enjoyed creating things. And I thought that the process of like bringing an idea to life, um, was so cool you know, yeah. just something that never existed before. And that's why Kickstarter is so cool. Like, I mean, the thinking hack or, mm -hmm. I mean, that did not, I don't think that existed. No, it didn't. It didn't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, um, and, and that's cool. And that's like, I think I've always been a little bit of a rebel and uh, the fact that you're like, wow, everything sucks. And you don't have to just like sit there and accept it. You can change it and say, wow, this sucks. Well, let's do something different. Sure. Um, I think that's what attracted me to entrepreneurship, the yeah, rebellion of it. Hey, I hear you. You, you just preach to the choir there. I, I, I moved my creative, uh, vibe to, you know, product launches and bringing stuff to life, you know? So, uh, exactly. yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's, it's funny how much I, uh, equate music and having that background into the most of yeah. those skill sets go into a really good CEO, you know, uh, being told no, having nobody listen, you know, being on stage and people like not even listening to the song you worked forever on. It's like, there's no different than like doing a prototype and people going, I don't get it. 
That sucks. Right? Oh, God. It's, it's gut-wrenching. Yeah, very little difference in that. But, um, well, let's flip over to the actual Kickstarter. So when we're talking, today's Wednesday the 29th. So you've got uh, – oh, my notes just uh, clicked out on me. So you've got 21 days to go here, so still some time. Um, you had a $10,000 goal, and you are basically uh, almost doubled it, uh, about 126 yes. backers, which is awesome. Um, so what was sort of the pre-launch strategy? What was some of the mindset behind, I'm going to go to Kickstarter, I'm going to launch this idea here? Um, you know, well, and as I said, I did do some pre-sales before and, um, uh, I didn't, in my view, um, Kickstarter had changed a little bit since these larger companies have kind of started coming on to Kickstarter and, and using it to fund new products. So I really wasn't sure about it. And then I, um, I listened to, uh, how I built this, the, um, NPR, I think does that. and um, and they interviewed one of the founders of Kickstarter. And I just, uh, the background and the arts and, and what it was all about, I was like, okay. So I, I kind of checked into it again. Yeah. Um, but it did, it seemed like a huge amount of work. I mean, the, the work to launch a Kickstarter and doing it alone and, and without a lot of funding, it really seemed like an overwhelming barrier. Uh, but, you know, I think I really reached out to um, the community. I found a lot of help. I found um, an amazing videographer that totally, like, worked with me all the way through the script and finding places to shoot and just, um, so I really lucked out with that. Um, I spent weeks doing the Kickstarter campaign. I mean, the website for anyone that's thinking of launching it operates like 90s dial up internet it's yeah. like yeah. it's the worst i was yeah. not prepared for that yeah, um, I, had, I had a we just had a client not too recently who's like she, a, you know good designer was like oh i got this and i was like just wait it logs in and like, yeah. what is this i'm like yep that's what we're dealing with behind the scenes here so then we all end up having yes. my guy do it because like my guy does it in a way where it's just like and he's just doing it in a way that is built for kickstarters we're not we're not building a fancy thing we're building it in this right. awful module widget thing from 1997 oh, so yes no it's yeah. I, I don't know if they do that on purpose or i think they have to because i think I, I think one of the reasons it's why they don't have uh pixel codes and they they really keep this thing as like you know real as possible without any gimmicks and stuff and and then you have guys like me who have to growth hack it basically so i spent yeah no exactly how to, how to hack it so but yeah but um that's cool so you know you know when you were kind of when you're putting together like your numbers and stuff what were some of the metrics you were looking for like did you have a a number in mind that you wanted to hit email subscribers or just w before you launched or you know how did yeah. you know that you were ready to launch basically oh i didn't uh, not at all. Um, <laughs> someone eventually was um, just like, it'll never be perfect and you'll never quite feel ready. Uh, one of the things that I felt, um, I had some samples come out and I had product testers lined up who were really enthusiastic about the product and um, that I knew would uh, really back my campaign and the product and, and what I was trying to do. And I think that Kind of gave me the confidence to to move forward but um i only had well i had maybe 200 emails at the time um i'd worked really hard on building up facebook and instagram especially instagram um i focused on a lot um just because the community there is um there's just a lot of sharing and collaboration and and I really enjoyed that aspect mm -hmm. of Instagram. Um, so I'd worked really hard on that for, let's see, um, it was nine months. And I think I worked on social media for all of that nine months. I probably started building my email list for about five months. Um, and then the samples came about a month before yeah. I launched to product yeah. testers. So cool. that was kind of yeah, the process, but I didn't feel ready. <laughs> yeah, right. Did you did you have any um, chance to maybe do any influencer outreach at all, or or is that where you were sending some products to? What is that what you're trying to do? Yeah. So, um, and I can't unfortunately um, can't remember who suggested. Well, so I had some people reaching out to me. Um, you know, dogs 
the community around dogs is very, um, people get super excited. It's very (laughs) communicative. It's very close. Um, and which is one of the reasons like when dog companies weren't answering their product reviews, I was like, what's going on? That doesn't remind me of the dog loving community at all. Like they want to talk, you know, they want to hear what you have to say. So, um, so I had some, uh, people that I now consider friends reach out to me and just love what I was doing and tried out the product or prototypes of the product and, and really loved it and supported it and, and kind of through word of mouth. Um, cause on Instagram, a lot of people kind of know each other within mm-hmm. the same space. Um, I reached out to kind of larger and larger audiences. Um, and I, I became confident enough to reach out to some of the influencers just be like, Hey, right. I'm a broke grad student, mm-hmm. but would you like to try a free product? Like, <laughs> yeah. Sure. <laughs> and um and luckily they were very like gracious and and welcoming and um you know willing to give me the benefit of the the doubt while that's I cruise. Cool. so it was it was awesome that's very cool so you know you've got 21 days to go when we're talking this will probably air you'll be at like middle probably the middle of the campaign is 15 days or so so what are you doing to keep the momentum going what are you doing to keep the uh, the energy up and not get into that trough of despair <laughs> oh. um, well, I haven't gotten to the trough of despair yet, uh, <laughs> but it does, it slows down, you know, it's super exciting. I, I often, when I'm, when I'm thinking about marketing and I don't know if it's a good thing to do or not, but I think about myself as a consumer and like, I'm super excited for about three days. And then if I hear from you some more, I'm kind of like annoyed <laughs> and I don't, I don't want to say that like a bad thing, but, um, you know, so I want to be gracious to people too and not overwhelm them, um, which I think can be a problem. Um, so we just started a contest on Instagram, uh, which we'll be running to the end of the campaign. Um, and it, there technical yep. difficulties yeah yeah you're back sorry yeah. about that that's all right you okay i'm back um so anyways so starting to do kind of some fun things instead of uh instead of just emailing everyone sorry i'm gonna close this window so it's less loud um oh here's my coworker. by the way yeah. can I say hi hey, yeah hey, hello yeah. <laughs> okay um <laughs> So, you know, just trying to make it fun and interactive. So like our contest, it has people looking through uh, the stories on Instagram of my product testers and seeing if they can spot the doggy bag. Mm. Um, So that was kind of a fun thing. And hopefully, you know, PR um, outreach to magazines, blogs, um, all that good stuff, local newspapers um, is always good events. uh, So trying to keep that all going. but. It's uh, exhausting. Oh, collaborations. I just learned about with other Kickstarter campaigns. Yep. Yep. Um, that was a new thing. I had a friend that launched a Kickstarter and she told me on your updates, you should do these collaborations. So um, on our next update, I reached out to a couple awesome Kickstarters. One had a kid's book for dogs. Um, there was a cookbook for you and your dog. Um, you know, kind of yeah, fun stuff cool. like that. No, cool great. Italian shoes. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, so just fun stuff like that. Um, but to try to keep it like interesting instead of just like, oh, look at me and my Kickstarter all right, the time. Right, right, right. Um, buy my thing, buy my thing, buy my thing, buy my thing. <laughs> I know when you become that person and yeah. you're annoyed by yourself, it's yeah. terrible. Yeah, yeah, so. it, it comes on quickly too. You have to, oh, that's me. I, um, <laughs> I'm an asshole. <laughs> yeah, you're like, oops. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> too far, too far. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that's cool. So, you know, so you've got obviously the, uh, the, the couple weeks to go in the campaign, and then it takes a few days for the money to drop and all that sort of stuff. But, but what right. starts the process to get the, uh, these bags, uh, sleeping bags out to the, the backers? Oh, that's a great question. So um, this is why I shouldn't be on my cell phone. Uh, let's see. So we actually, um, our sleeping bags are already being cut and sewn. So 
I'm kind of the leap before you look kind of person. So I was like, yeah, go for it. Mm. Um, without any money on the table. Mm -hmm. So uh, (laughs) now it's going to be like going to look for that bridge loan Mm -hmm. to try to fund everything until, because it takes about, I've heard four to six weeks after the campaign to actually receive your funds. Um, So I've come to realize that cash flow as an entrepreneur tends to be like this cup game where you're like hiding a little bit over here and switching it over there. And, um, I I hate it. Like that's been no fun. The the whole cash flow game is um, kind of over my head. But uh, but they're being made, so uh, they'll be delivered by the holiday season, which was a goal of mine because that's always important. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's great. So makes a great gift. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a great (laughs) gift. Uh, Christmas in August. See, I'm that person. Yeah, (laughs) I might think. Uh, so what, what does like the next year look like? I mean, is this something where it's just focused on this product alone or, you know, what do you see, what do you see, uh, over the next, uh, you know, 365 days? You know, that's a a great question. So, um, you know, the concept of wild river. So I was a, I was disappointed with the products that were out there. I felt like, um, there were only a few companies and they were kind of, pumping up the margins because they knew that dog owners would pay more for kind of a crappy product, to Mm -hmm. be honest. Um, And I didn't think that was fair or right. And I also felt like there should be a more collaborative um, pet company. Um, So my goal is uh, what I'd really like is a website that really features kind of a forum and a group like right from the beginning. And Mm -hmm. um, what I'd really like is for Wild River to be the private brand that makes what you can't find or sure. the product that's not good enough. So there's um, the sleeping bag is a small step towards uh, a big push to to really become um, hopefully a pet brand that people identify with. Yeah, that's that's my dog's <laughs> old man grown. Sorry about that. Um, you know, and uh, I asked a lot of my friends who are big dog lovers, like, what's a brand that you love and I, you know, identify with as as a dog person, mm-hmm. and and they couldn't name anything. So mm-hmm. to me, that's Wild River's opportunity is to be like, oh, I love Wild River and they represent who I am as a dog lover and um, it's given me a sense of community and sure. I feel like I have a voice, um, you know, so that's, that's the goal. That's it's great. That's a big great. goal, but. <laughs> yeah, no, it, that's great. And, and I mean, and do you see that as being sort of the, um, you know, sort of like maybe like the five year plan? I know it's so hard to look out that far. I mean, the internet could be completely different in five years, but, but just kind of right. standing back and going, you know, I, I envision myself being the CEO of this company, not Yes, because some people just want to build mm-hmm. this and then move on to the next thing. But you kind of envision that like you're all in on this brand and what this dream and this sort of stuff. Yeah, all in. That's cool. Um, yeah, I, I mean, yeah, that's uh, five years is probably ambitious, but I think keeping I'm definitely a long term goal kind of person. So keeping that in the forefront, it'll probably be like a lot of products and a lot of baby steps to get mm-hmm. there. But um, that's the big dream. Yeah, that's great. That's awesome. Well, Rachel, where can people find out more information? How can they dive into your world and learn about the stuff you're working on? Well, you can search for Wild River, which is W-H-Y-L-D, River, R-I-V-E-R. Um, search it on Google. Our website, wildriver.com, will pop up. Uh, I'm hoping our Kickstarter campaign will <laughs> pop up. Yeah. Um, we've had some articles, some reviews. Some of our product testers have even compared our sleeping bag to some other ones on the market. So um, check out any of that. And That's I'm cool. an open book. You can always uh, contact Rachel at wildriver.com with any questions. Awesome. Well, thanks, Rachel. I appreciate it taking time out of your busy schedule here. I know it's a lot going on with an active campaign, but uh, this is a great conversation, great product, and uh, I wish you nothing but success. Congrats on it. Thanks, Jeff. This was fun. Awesome. Thank you. Great. Well, thanks so much. I appreciate it. All right. Bye. Bye.